So, all right, let's continue on this, this series we're in. Uh, I love what Danny said. She, she's right. We're talking about what it means to be a reaching church, a teaching church, a connecting church, and next week, a sending church. Uh, a couple weeks ago, we talked about reaching, and then last week, teaching, and today we're going to focus on this whole idea of what does it mean for us as a church to be a connecting church. It's all about relationships. It's all about relationships. Life, really, is all about relationships. Think about this. We were created by a relational God. It's part of His nature. He is relational by nature. Before He spoke anything into existence, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit were in a beautiful little community. We actually see conversations that happened there uh, before beforehand but we were created by a relational God in his image as relational beings to do life in relationship with God and with each other not in isolation not on an island not as lone rangers in Genesis chapter 2 there's a really interesting verse now if you're familiar with the Bible you know how this goes it opens up in genesis 1 with the creation of all things god speaks and creation comes into being it starts with light and then he separates water from water and creates the atmosphere and then he begins to 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 produce things on dry land as as plants and then creatures and then ultimately man and at the uh at, at all the way all the way through he says it is good it is good it is good when he creates man he says, it is very good. And Genesis chapter 2, verse 18 is the very first time that God says, oh, wait, that's not good. It's the first time God says something isn't good. Verse 18, it says, it's quoting, or God is speaking this. It says, it is not good for man to be alone. And that's where he creates the woman. and takes the, the, the rib from Adam and, and creates a helper for him. We thrive, as human beings, we thrive when we're in healthy relationships. When we have healthy relationships with people who love us and love the Lord, that makes us better. And we shrivel up in isolation. And it's so interesting because the very first thing the enemy will do to you when you're struggling is try to get you to, to pull back and go into isolation. To pull back from people. To drop out. And that's by design. He knows that we shrivel up when we pull back like that. Uh, have you ever noticed that we crave companionship in the very best times in life and the very hardest or worst times in life? I remember, I remember so well, if you have kids, man, you remember it too in your life when your kids are born. My kids, Josh and Carol, were both born kind of far away from our immediate family and and uh, longtime friends and so man when they were born we were on the phone just for a long time and and i didn't ever get tired of telling the story of oh this is what happened and here's how and then care and then and this and i got to and and man i was just so excited to say kara's here josh is here remember that and when people would come in and see the baby what a celebration what a bummer that would be if that happened in isolation and you couldn't share that with somebody uh I think about my graduation from Johnson and, and two people that drove down from Indiana for that to Knoxville. My dad drove down, and my grandfather, who was close to 90 years old, drove down. Because uh, at that point, I was the first one in our family to graduate from college. I remember my grandpa, that was so, I was so touched <coughs> that he made that trip to, to be part of that graduations are awesome we've all been part of those when our baby whether it's high school or or college and and you know they call the name and they start coming across and somebody up in the top says no even though you're not supposed to you know they say hold hold your applause to the end why do we do that because it's awesome and we're celebrating and and graduation would be just a bummer if we were just walking across the stage by ourselves you know we want to celebrate those things um weddings Weddings are events. Weddings are awesome. When we're coming together to covenant, two lives, covenant with one another in the sight of God to, to do life till death do us part and to love one another like that. And it's an event. 
I remember when we got married that, that we, had, we had college friends and some professors. Uh, I remember Don Collins was there and um, a family that had driven a long way and our church family. And man, it just made it so much better to be able to do that with people. And then, of course, the other side of the coin is when we're hurting, when, we're, when we get crushed, when we get disappointed, when our heart is broken. We seek out companionship. We seek out people we love and who love us because uh, we need that. We need people to help us carry those burdens. In time of loss, I've done a lot of funerals, and funerals draw people together. We come together to encourage each other, to comfort each other. Sometimes we see people at those moments that we haven't seen for years because it just brings us together. And friends, here's what I want you to really think about this morning. That's by design. That's by design. That didn't just arbitrarily evolve in our species. <laughs> Relationship is sovereignly woven into your DNA. It is part of you. It is a reflection of the image of God that you bear. Because He's a relational God and we're made in His image to do relationship with Him and with each other. That's why, in addition to be a reaching church, a church that proclaims the gospel, the good news of Christ, and invites people to, into relationship with Him, and, and being a teaching church that, that, that really wants to do everything we can to help you fill up on the Word of God, the truth of God, God's perspective on your life so that you grow strong and deeply rooted in His truth. We also want to be a connecting church. Because learning to live in relationship with brothers and sisters, developing what I call Christ-centered friendships. We all need Christ-centered friendships in our life. It is so, so, so important. So here's what I'm going to do today. I want to give you three images. I want to talk about three images of connection or connectedness that the New Testament speaks of. There's more that we could look at, but... We'll just look at these three. And then I want to say a word about small groups here at First Christian and our hopes and dreams for, for that as we go forward. Okay, here's the first image that I want us to consider this morning of connectedness from the Bible. It is uh, the image of the ecclesia. That might be a brand new word for some of you, but if you've been around church, you might have heard that before. The ecclesia. It's a, it's a Greek word, and it's the word that in our, in our English Bibles is translated church. Okay, we, we here, we call ourselves the first Christian church, right? Matthew chapter 16, verse 18, Jesus speaking to his disciples says, I will build my church. I will build my ecclesia. And all the powers of uh, of hell will not conquer it so whatever this ecclesia is it's a pretty powerful thing huh <laughs> because the all the powers of hell will not conquer it and jesus of course is the one who says he will build it well let's define this word ecclesia means a called out assembly of people okay and there's two things in there that are super important in that definition. A called out assembly of people. First off, it's not an institution. It's not a building. It's not a religious system. It's not any of that stuff. It's an assembly of people who have been called out. So, here's how this works. As individuals, each of us who have a testimony of Christ's work in our life and we've made a decision to follow Him, we, we have a story of, of, of some point in our life there was a chapter when we began or we began to become aware we, that we needed God however that looked like in your life you, you became aware of your brokenness your need maybe it was a time of crisis however that happened you became aware that God is real and that He's awesome and, and you came to understand that He's holy and He's righteous and that we've fallen short of that and so this thing, conviction, whether you knew that word or not, began to stir up in your heart that you, you fell short. And someone, or in some way, you came into contact, you heard the good news about Jesus. You heard that, that, that God loved you and loves all of us so much that He didn't leave us in our brokenness, but He sent His Son 
to come and he shed his blood on the cross Jesus took the punishment that we all deserved for our sin in light of a holy God to appease God's holiness he took it for you and me you heard that good news and in response you understood or you were taught that you could receive Christ wow you could be forgiven wow that's why it's called good news right you could be restored. You could be brought into the family of God and, and forgiven and made new. And, and so you turned to Jesus and you became a follower of Jesus. I heard something this week that I thought was really interesting. I, I love this, 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 this concept. That when you become a follower of Jesus, by definition, you repent. That's a, that's a church word. If you haven't heard the word repent, it means to turn, a 180, to, to change your mind and, and your life and go a different direction. But listen, when you make a decision, wherever you are in your life... I'm going to follow Jesus. By definition, you choose to quit following everything else. Right? I don't want to live for this world. I don't want to live for me or this stuff anymore. I'm going to follow Jesus. I'm going to learn what it means that He's Lord and Savior and what He teaches. I'm going to line my life up with who He is. I'm going to put my faith in Him. I'm going to follow. We've been talking about the Great Commission all through this series. And, and one of the things, first things Jesus says, he says, be baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and I'm going to enter into a life of following him as a disciple. So you did that, okay? By, by doing that, now you're part of this community. We all share that story in some, some fashion. So we're part of this ecclesia. We, got, we experienced the call. We came out of our old life and into this new one, and now collectively we're part of this thing called God's people or the ecclesia think about this I think this is so so cool for lack of a better theological word of all the ways that God could have redeemed the earth and he's God he could do this any way that he wanted to but here's how God chose to redeem us he became one of us he left heaven Christ being in very nature God did not consider equality with God something to be grasped Philippians chapter 2 he let go of it and he put on skin and he was born right into this broken world and he lived among us the backdrop of this whole thing I just want you to think relational God coming to live with us he lived with us and when it came time for him to start his ministry, guess what he did? He started a small group. He went out and he handpicked 12 guys. Said, okay, no, not everybody, just these 12. And I'm going to do life with you guys. We're going to spend time together. And by the way, there's never been a more diverse small group on planet Earth than these 12. You want to... You want to do a really fun study? Do a character study of the things that we know about each individual disciple. I'll just mention two of them to give you an image of this, okay? He brought these guys into this group. Sometimes when we start a group, we go out and try to find it. people who are just like us, right? Jesus didn't do that. He picked Matthew, the tax collector. Now, first century, you live in a country, Rome has conquered your country. The Roman Empire has conquered, they occupied your country. They're... they're, they're, they're they're ruling over you you're in oppression to them well Matthew's way of dealing with it was and this is how his fellow Israelites would have seen it he was a sellout he just partnered with them he became part of the system and became a tax collector he took money from his own people and sent it to Rome oh and by the way siphoned off about a huge percentage of it and grew rich off his own people's oppression okay he wasn't a liked guy we don't like paying taxes either, really, do we? So, so that was Matthew. Then if you filter through the list of disciples, you come across this guy named Simon the Zealot. Now, if you do a little study on that, Simon was committed to the cause of killing people like Matthew. <laughs> he, in a sense, you could, almost, you could almost say Simon was part of a group that would have been considered terrorists to the Romans. By any means, they wanted to undermine the rule of Rome. They wanted to turn it over. They were, they were very militaristic, uh, very aggressive, anti-Rome, big time. So Jesus brings Matthew and Simon together and the rest of them and says, Hey, 
here's what we're going to do we're going to do life together and, and, and there's a two there's a two step plan here over these three years you're going to learn as my disciples what it looks like to follow me as Lord and you're going to learn in that process how to love each other and that my friends really and truly that's Christianity in a nutshell learning what it looks like learning to follow Jesus as our Lord and learning how in that process as he's impacting our hearts and we're growing in what it means to receive grace from him to share that with each other and so that's what they did that is the crux of the faith and then after three years and after his death burial and resurrection he gave them the great commission to go repeat the process okay now I want you guys to go and make disciples who will make disciples who will make disciples I want you to go and invite people to come in to relationship with me disciple them baptize them and teach them to learn how what it looks like to obey me and follow me and love each other and you know what we have as the result of all of that the book of acts that's what the book of acts is it's the proclamation of the good news of jesus inviting people in to do life together and and when you look at the first couple chapters of acts you see this pattern emerge the early church they met together in large groups they met daily in the temple courts massive structure massive setting large groups they also met together in homes all the time large groups and small groups Acts chapter 2 verses 42 through 47 now that's not in your outline but you might if, you're, if you are taking notes you might write this down in your margins Acts chapter 2 verses 42 through 47 I call it the great snapshot okay we have the great commission that Jesus gave go into the world and make disciples we have the great command love the Lord your God with all your heart soul mind and strength and the one that's just like it love your neighbor as yourself and I call this the great snapshot because it's such a beautiful little picture of the life of the early church Acts 2 42 through 47 it starts by saying that they devoted themselves the early Christians they devoted themselves to the apostles teaching that's the word of God uh, to the fellowship koinonia to, to doing life together loving serving caring supporting one another to the breaking of bread that that through through the years some scholars have said that is communion some have said that's sharing meals together I'm good with both because the church certainly did both of them a lot right but they devoted themselves to that and uh, to prayer and then right after that verse 42 you see this picture of how they cared for each other and they met one another's needs and they they supported each other and then verse 47 says and God added to their number daily those who are being saved here's how I kind of see that when the church authentically genuinely not in a, a religious way but genuinely loves jesus and and wants to come together because of their mutual just just devotion to him as lord and out of that they love one another genuinely and care for each other oh friends the evangelistic program becomes hey can i come in and be part of this you see what i'm saying because it's so drastically different than what's going on in the world we actually love and we, it's not about backbiting and climbing the corporate rad, ladder and who can I step on to get ahead it's hey I'm not going to consider my own needs I'm going to consider others before myself I want to love each other I want to care for you I want to be there for, each, for you and, and that is the human soul craves that and so, so, so God added to their number those who were being saved and so over and over and over and over again we see this happening throughout Christian history it's about inviting people into relationship with Jesus and then into relationship with Jesus' people in community loving and caring and serving and doing mission together that is a powerful image of the church then image number two is the body of Christ 
I heard that phrase many, many, many times before. The Bible speaks very directly about the body of Christ. Paul pulls this up as an analogy to help us understand what the church is about. And um, really, the lesson that, that, that kind of comes to the top for me when I think about the body of Christ is that we are all interdependent. Okay? We're not independent, and we're not, in, a, in an unhealthy way, dependent on each other, but we're interdependent. We need each other. We all bring something to the table that is a blessing and that would be missed if it, if it wasn't there in terms of our ability, our personality, our smile, you know, our experience, things we've learned, all of it, things we can do, provision, all of it. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 27, Paul says, Now, you, collectively, all of you who have become followers of Jesus, you are the body of, Je or, or the body of Christ. And each one of you is a part of it. The word part kind of indicates a significant part of it that would be missed if you weren't here. 1 Corinthians 12, 12 says the body is a unit. It's a great word. I, I, the, 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 or the, the, the image that came to my mind as I was thinking about how to kind of explain unit is a car. Your vehicle, it has tires and rims and an axle and brakes and spark plugs and pistons and, you know, a transmission and seats and a, it has all these parts. But they all collectively are called a car, okay? And that's exactly what Paul's saying. The body of Christ is extremely diverse. Just look around. I've always been blown away by what God could do with two eyes, a nose, a mouth, and hair. If that's all I got to work with, maybe I can come up with six or seven faces that look sort of different. Look around this room, and then multiply it by the population of the world. I mean, we are all so unique. Do you know, do you know, just as a side thing, do you know that no one's heart beats with exactly the same rhythm? No one. You have a unique signature to your heartbeat. Isn't that awesome? Nobody has your DNA. Nobody. Nobody has your fingerprint. You are, you, you are individual to, to, the, to the max. And yet all of us come together in Christ and we form one unit. Though the, uh, the body is a unit, though it is made up of many parts, and though all of its parts are many or diverse, they form one body. And so it is with Christ. All of us uh, play a significant role in the church we need each other we're interdependent you might feel like your role is small maybe you know, you're making coffee or or you're doing something and, and it just feels like nobody sees that you do it or you you come here and you're like you know i just kind of attend sunday school and hang out and talk to people well listen who you are makes a difference the conversations you have make a difference big time uh and if it wasn't there you would it would be noticed um i remember 19 the mid 1990s I was serving the First Church of Christ in Altoona, Pennsylvania, and John Collins, the lead minister there, and I flew out from, from Pittsburgh out to Los Angeles to uh, go to Saddleback Church, where Rick Warren is the, the pastor, and, and Purpose Driven was like huge at that time, and we took in that seminar. Well, on the way out there, I started noticing what felt like Mount Everest on my tongue. You ever had an inflamed taste bud? In, taste bud? You know where it gets sore, like eat something too spicy or something? I get these once in a while. You can't even see a taste bud if you look in the mirror. I mean, it's so small. But it feels huge in my mouth, and it's bothering me. And I, oh, the whole flight, mm, it's just driving me nuts. And I don't know why we do this. Maybe you don't do this, but when that thing hurts, I keep working on it. Why do we do that? Leave it alone. Let it heal. I just got crazy but anyway i'm working on it the whole way out there it's driving me crazy it's getting worse it's getting worse we get out and i get off the plane and i'm like i, I can't stand it anymore i'm like john can you see this this and he looks at it and it feels like this big in my mouth he's like i don't see anything <laughs> friends see you might feel like in the whole scheme of the body of christ you're just a little taste bud and you don't really matter oops sorry you don't really matter 
But I'm telling you what, you get inflamed, you matter. Okay? You matter. You count. When one part of the body suffers, we all suffer. Right? My foot was fine, man, but it was on hold. I wasn't a too bad foot. I'm not thinking about you. I'm thinking about this mountain in my mouth. So it's, we all matter. That's the point. We all matter. We all have a role to play. When I eat lunch, I'm thankful for that taste bud that's healthy now. You know? Mmm. Because it works. Big role. Great role. All right. So there's, there's the ecclesia. We're called out of our old life and into this new life of following Jesus. And as such, we become part of a community of people with Jesus at the top. And then we become part of this body. And we're all, even though we're so unique, we bring together who we are and, and we make this beautiful body that depends on and serves and works together. And then image three is the family of God. What a beautiful, tender, warm picture of God's people. We are a family. God is our Father. We are brothers and sisters in Christ. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 19. Paul says, So you are no longer outsiders or aliens. Before we were in Christ, we were not part of God's people. We were outside, but now we've been brought in. And we are fellow citizens. Paul there's kind of thinking in terms of the, the kingdom of God, which is another picture we could paint of the people of God and our connectedness. But now we're citizens together with every other Christian. And listen to this. You belong, you belong, you belong uh, now to the household of God or the family of God. You belong. And, and, and what just jumped out at me and I wrote down... Please never ever think that you don't belong here. You belong uh, in, in this place in Christ. We are family. We might aggravate each other. We might misspeak. We might disappoint each other. We, we might even hurt each other sometimes. We're human beings. But you know what we do? We forgive each other. We, we work it out. We press on. We extend grace. And we move on and turn the page. And as a result, we grow closer to each other. The best relationships you have are the ones you've worked through those difficult times in. Right? That's what makes those relationships grow is, is mutual grace and forgiveness and, and, and growing together through that. And so we support each other and we help each other and we challenge each other. We are connected in the ecclesia we are connected as the body of Christ and we're connected as a family of believers with one father and one savior learning how to follow him while we learn how to love each other it's awesome now there are lots of ways that we can kind of step into connectedness or step into relationship and develop that I jotted a little list down here uh, we can we can engage in in what I call hang time after church we've got a whole foyer out here or I, I call it a foyer or lobby a hallway uh, that's funny first time when I started here I, I, I was used to calling the, the area out there the foyer and so I said what you call it that nobody's gonna know what it is just call it the lobby I said okay okay well anyway anyway out there but there's time before service, after service. You can just hang and you can converse. We created the coffee corner for the very purpose and put seats there just to facilitate a place to sit down and talk. Holy, wonderful kingdom things happen when people sit down and have conversations. So, so you can connect in, in that space. You can, uh, you can connect at dinners come to a dinner and we, there's always conversation we serve when we when we eat together uh, you can serve with someone plug into a ministry man you get to know people when you serve with them you, you converse and you talk about your your life you can attend a class you're in and to a degree you know even though it's the teacher kind of sharing you're still going to have an opportunity to talk before and after and get to know each other lots of ways but there's one that kind of rises above in terms of developing Christ-centered friendships that, 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 that really 
make it an impact and, and that, that help us to grow spiritually and that is small groups in my experience it, it's huge um, there's a collection of commands in the New Testament called the one another's and you've heard that phrase before over 50 commands in the New Testament throughout the letters and the gospels that include the phrase one another and all of them together when you when you study them they paint a picture of what life in in the family of God should look like there there's statements like love Jesus said love one another as I have loved you that second part's real important right love one another as I have loved you encourage one another honor one another teach one another confess your sins to one another James says um and on and on and on and on and on. Uh, all of those are experienced best not in a large group setting like this, right? And we're not going to stand up and start sharing here. Uh, it doesn't happen best in a classroom, really, uh, because it, it just it, it's not it doesn't facilitate that kind of opening up. That happens best when you're with a group of people that you've done some life with, six, eight, ten people, and and, and I think I said even last week, but you know their story and they know yours and you've done some chapters of life together and helped each other, been through some fire and some mountaintops and you've learned to really trust each other. That facilitates an environment where you can kind of open up and begin to be vulnerable and let them love on you and vice versa and, and really take some steps in that area of your life. It's so important. Let me give you two examples of, of how this works. Just two of the one another commands. The first one that I want us to look or consider is to admonish one another. Colossians chapter 3, verse 16. Paul says, admonish one another. In a simple kind of way to define that is let each other or hold each other accountable. Okay? That doesn't happen when you don't know somebody. You know, to actually be your brother's keeper or your sister's keeper. To, to as you walk in relationship when you see a friend someone or a, you know, a brother in Christ a sister in Christ when you see their life begin to head toward that cliff it is not loving to close your eyes and say well I'll just let them go that's the opposite of loving right as much as people say oh don't, you know, they don't like us messing or getting in our grill so to speak but you love them enough to say hey you know I love you you know I love you we've done life together and you know it's not even about judge or any of that I just care about you and I see this happening and so I, I want to admonish you I want to help you and I'm open to you doing that in my life when I need it too right mutual um, man we need people in our life who we know love us enough that we can go there with hey warning you know, anybody um, maybe I'm I don't know it's an old show um, lost in space remember this we need that little robot that comes along and says, Warning Will Robinson, warning Will Robinson. Okay, I'm too old. Nobody remembers it. <laughs> danger, danger, that's it. Danger Will Robinson, that's it, see? All right, good. But we need people like that in our life. We do. And that, that happens best in a community when we, we, we've taken the time to get to know each other. Another one is uh, carry one another's burdens. Wow. Now, you know what's really really cool I'm so blessed to be able to tell you that even this week I experienced firsthand first Christian caring for one another there's some things that happened you know without going into all the story just people in need and people saying hey I'll, I'll take some time out of my day or my week and I'll just bless or help or serve or provide or help that person get where they need to go or whatever it's, it's awesome to see the love that is in this congregation for one another it's great um, but in a small group when there's only six, eight, or ten of you, you're just going to be so much more in tune with each other's lives, what's going on, the needs that are there, and, and be able to meet those. Um, one story that, that comes to my mind whenever I think about this particular verse, where Paul says, meet one, or carry one another's burdens. I heard a minister talking about this one time. After his message, he invited people to come forward for prayer, and a couple came, uh, and it was kind of a line and, and, and when they got to him uh, they were holding a baby 
and they began to explain that their child had been born with some pretty severe birth defects and that as a result the doctors had had said it was the child wasn't going to live very long and so they said we we just would like for you to pray for us and pray for our child of course this minister he just went on and on about how his heart was broken and overwhelmed and so desperately wanted to provide mercy and help and do something he said they 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 pulled the the blanket back and it was really obvious that this child had some serious issues he didn't know what to do so he prayed of course asked for healing trusting god lifting this child up and for mercy and everything else that he could think of in terms of god just intervening in this situation said amen he said is there anything i can do and they said uh, to him very calm very steady no it's it's okay it's okay we we're trusting the lord we know he's got this and we've got our small group we'll be fine and he said he saw them turn and begin to walk back up the aisle and all of a sudden from out of the seats these 10 people came and they just huddled around them and hugged them and walked with them out of the worship space and he just this minister he just went on and said it just so impacted my heart to see that love come out from those seats and to see you know there's a there's a thousand people here but those ten man they are doing it together caring for each other it's powerful you know you can't know everybody so many studies have shown that even in a room this this size 100 people it's, it's hard to know 100 people you can't know everybody but everybody needs to know five or six or seven you know everybody needs to know a, a handful of people who, who can who can minister to them it's huge and so small groups are just a really dynamic way for that to happen and that's why in 2019 over the course of this year myself our staff the elders we're going to press into this and study and pray and and really look at this from every angle and and i'd love to talk to you if you have thoughts about small groups because we want to really really understand this not just in a book way but how can we incorporate small groups into the life of our church in a meaningful way that will truly bless and facilitate relationships our, our goal is that in 2020 to kind of really move into that but as i said you're thinking that's a year um that's just 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 we want to make sure we do that right at the same time you don't have to wait till 2020 to start a small group okay it's really simple this is the beauty of a of a small group i know some of us i, I i've heard folks speak i know we have some in our church who are already plugged in and and meeting midweek or or uh, once a month or whatever in a family room or something it's awesome you know i just say amen keep going but uh, you need just need three things to start a small group it's really really simple okay here they are number one you need people you gotta have people can't have a small group without people okay but you and a couple friends or if you're a married couple you and a couple married couples boom you got your group okay the second thing you really need is a bible you need a bible um, if you don't have one come see me i'll give you one if you have a smartphone you have as many bibles as you need okay you can download one in three seconds if you don't know how find a teenager they'll help you get it done <laughs> right they'll help you get it done and uh boom if if you're looking for something just just quick and easy message notes every week talk it over you got your you got your curriculum right there it's just that simple so you got your you got your group of friends you got a few people you, you got a bible some of the very by the way some of the very best small group meetings i've ever been in had nothing to do with curriculum we read the first chapter of first john and then we talked about it and we just engaged and we challenged each other and somebody brought up a verse and somebody brought up a verse and we talked about our life and it was awesome it was dynamic uh and then the third thing you need is a place just a place to meet it's that simple it really is it can be a family room you could you could say hey can i use a, could we use a room out here at the church one night a week if you don't have somewhere else sure uh i had a group in altoona pennsylvania a group of guys 
that we met at King's Restaurant on 7th Avenue every Thursday morning before our work day. And we had this table, and the waitress, they, all, they knew us all by name, and we knew them by name, and that was our table. And we would sit and eat breakfast, and we would talk about football, and man stuff, and then and for about you know 30 minutes, and then we'd move into God's Word. And we'd read a passage. We just kept it really simple. We'd, we'd read a passage and uh, work through a New Testament book usually and, uh, and, and, and say, wow, throw it out there. What, what about that phrase? And we'd just take off and we'd encourage and challenge each other and it was awesome and then in about 30 minutes we'd pray for each other and we'd go to work awesome tremendous things that came out of that so it's really 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 simple to do that so to wrap it up we are part of God's family in Christ we are part of this thing called the ecclesia we are part of this thing called the body of Christ because of Jesus we need each other we love each other. It's, and, and, and we're called into this life where we follow Jesus, learning what it means to follow Him as Lord. Simultaneously, we're learning because this is what He does. He moves us to learn how to love each other in that process. And so I want to close with this question. Are you part of the family of God today? And two clarifiers. One, I'm not asking you, and I am saying this because I, I, I've experienced this a lot in my life. When I say that, I'm not saying, do you believe in God? I, I, I believe that everyone in this room does. I absolutely believe that you believe in God, and that's awesome. Um, scriptures say that's super important. But what I'm saying is, have you, like I mentioned earlier, encountered a time in your life when you knew that you needed God in your life? And someone shared with you, and if they haven't, I'll share with you right now. Christ died for you. He shed His blood for you to cover over every broken spot in your life. Every, the Bible calls this sin. All the places we've fallen short of his, his glory. Jesus took the hit for all of it. Paid it all to satisfy God so that you could turn and follow Him, which means we're turning away from everything else and say, I'm going to follow Him. You can do that today. You can follow Him in baptism, great commission, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, buried with Christ, rise up. Man, you can do that today. I just, I feel like I'm having an MA moment. You guys all know MA. I love MA. <laughs> I just want to go. You ever had a conversation? So, it just filled up. It's awesome. Love it. Anyway, you can do that today. I'm also not saying, though, do you attend church? Because, friends, disciples, people, fr brothers and sisters who are in Christ, yes, we gather together to worship. But we do this not in order to make God think we're good. We do this because of what God has done for us at the cross. We gather here because He's alive in our hearts and we've been transformed. And we, we can't imagine being anywhere else but with our brothers and sisters lifting up Jesus on Sunday morning, right? So, so I'm not saying do you attend church, but I'm saying have you plugged in and, 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 and engaged and said this is my family and this is where I want to serve and love and grow and, and experience all those things.